recording. Okay, so good morning. Welcome everybody um, to this uh, Q webinar on quality management systems. Um, so for those of you who don't know the Q community, it's a network of over 4,000 people from health and care who are committed to making improvements. Um, somebody's not on mute because I've got an echo. So if you just don't mind muting. Yeah, is that okay? Fantastic. Okay, I'll carry on. So those of you who don't know Q, it's a network of over 4,000 people across the country in UK and Ireland, um, all committed to improving health and care and sharing ideas that they think are interest to other people. Um, and as a Q member and, and my fellow Q member, Joy, um, we've been really interested in quality management systems for some time. Um, and we've worked with John to see what, um, whether we can bring together a webinar that gives you an overview. So delighted that you can join us. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce us all um, and then we'll go through the webinar, tell you what to expect. So first things first, if you could stay muted, that would be great just for now. Um, and then when we're ready, we might let you speak. Okay, so my name is Emma Adams. I'm an improvement consultant and I work across NHS in um, all parts of the UK. Um, and I'm a Q member. Um, I'll introduce you to Dr. Joy Furnival. So Joy, can you just say hello so we can see who you are? Hello everybody, I'm Joy Furnival. Uh, nice to see all your lovely faces on the Zoom call this morning. Um, currently I'm working as Chief of Regulatory Compliance and Improvement at the Northwest Ambulance Service, but I've seen so many friends and colleagues on this call, so nice to see you all. Many of you know I've worked for nationally and in other NHS providers, so great to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Joy. And can I also say hello to John? John, would you like to say hello to everyone? Yeah, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm John. I think I've spent my whole career working in uh, quality and improvement. Delighted to join the session today and, and hoping to, to learn a lot. Currently, I'm the founder of a software company called Changeway. And yeah, I've been thoroughly enjoying working with Emma and Joy to prepare the, the session for today. So delighted with the attendance. Uh, let's have a fantastic session, everyone. OK, thanks, John. Um, and I've got two out of my three guests, I think, here. So hello to, to Ian. Ian, would you like to say hello? Morning. How are you all? It's nice yeah. to see you, Emma, and Joy. Thank you, Ian. So Ian's Programme Lead for Improvement Methodology at NHS England, and he'll be joining our celebrity interview later. And can I also say hello to Francis Wiseman? Hello, Francis. Hi, hello. Um, I'm Francis Wiseman. I'm uh, Deputy Director of Transformation, um, and I think I might be on the celebrity panel because uh, we are in the process of implementing a quality management system. So. Looking forward to sharing our experience and learning with you later. Fantastic, Francis. And because I gave you the wrong link, you're called Horiam Ramos. So if you could rename yourself, that would be fantastic. And um, Andy Heaps will be joining us later from um, West Sussex Hospital. He'll be coming in around half past 10, so we'll see him then. OK, so without further ado, uh, this is how we're going to run the session. Um, can we have the next slide, please? Okay. OK, so um, if you can stay on mute while we present the core material, that would be great. Um, can I go back slightly? Yeah, so chat's open throughout. So um, feel free to chat to us all or chat to people you know. Um, so there might be some questions, and we'll try and keep an eye on those as we go. Um, at the end of each presentation, we'll try and um, open for questions there. Um, raise your hand if you want to speak, but just to let you know that um, it's hard for the presenters to see that, but there's a little team of us watching, so if you do want to talk, do put your hand up via Zoom, no, not on screen, um, and uh, don't worry if your tech fails, because we're recording everything, and we will post it on the Q website afterwards, so you can see both the slides, and you can see the recording after that. Um, feel free to um, tweet if you want. So uh, we'd like you to tag the Q community and also hashtag QComQMS if you can. And really don't worry if window cleaner, dog or whatever interrupts because it may well interrupt us as well. Um, but that's absolutely fine. We're all used to this new world, aren't we? So just a quick run through how we're going to run this session. So um, we've done welcome and introductions. Um, I'm going to do a little brief quality management 101 
Um, Joy is going to take us a little bit through how quality management systems are developing in healthcare. And then we're going to have what we're calling a celebrity interview. So we've got our celebrities lined up. Um, these are three people that have got great experience in quality management systems in their organizations. Um, and we'll be quizzing them on the, um, what they've learned and what they uh, are looking to develop. Then John's going to take us through um, the future of QMS based on his own extensive experience within the private sector and um, industries that have been adapting and um, adopting this over years. Um, we'll have a little group discussion and then we'll have a summary and close. Okay, so without further ado, let's um, open up with a very quick poll. So is John taking us through this poll? Yeah, I'm happy to do that, Emma. Yeah. So you can see Jonium has uh, shared the Zoom poll here. Just to give us a feel for the kind of people who are on the call, your level of experience. So yeah, what's your personal experience of, of QMS? It'll help us get to know a little bit about you as an audience and hopefully, yeah, maybe tailor the way we uh, we deliver the programme today. So it should be nice and easy. Uh, just choose an option. Let's see what we've got. Um, that's fantastic. We've got a real spread, haven't we? Literally people at the beginning of the journey curious to, to learn all the way through to people actively leading a, a QI programme. And actually quite an even uh, mix. Lots of people building uh, skills, which is great. I really hope we can... Uh, help by, by sharing some some learning and some experience today. Uh, wonderful join. We've got sort of 80-odd uh, percent participation. I think uh, we'll give that just another five or 10 seconds and then we'll, we'll wrap that up. We will share the poll results along with the outputs of the chat, as, as Emma mentioned, uh, as we go through the session team. So you'll be able to look out for a, a posting on the uh, Q community page, uh, hopefully aim to get that to you within 24, 48 hours of the, the webinar concluding. Uh, and I think we've got a fantastic level of participation in that poll. Shall we? Uh, shall we move on? I mean, a great number of yeah. people building, fantastic. building skills, which okay. is encouraging to see. That's brilliant. Hopefully, I haven't got another echo again. Um, that's really nice to see such a great spread, actually. So today's the purpose of today is to give you a bit of a, an overview. Um, and from what I can see, some people may be already well steeped in this. So we'd encourage you to um, share with others and um, bring your own learning and you know, your experience into this webinar if you can. So can we close the poll, please? Okay, so um, so we're going to take you through um, briefly what quality management is. Um, and the purpose of this is to help your own organizational thinking. Um, the topic's really huge. There are many variants to quality management systems. So for now, we're just going to give you an overview. And we may well, in, in time to come, um, run some masterclasses. So the idea is to just give you a bit of a, a background. Um, so why um, do we find this interesting? Well, I've worked in healthcare and management for um, many, many years and lately in improvement. And one of the things that's always struck me is um, how different improvement can be from other parts of our business. Um, so very little integration with our performance side or our program management offices or our strategy. And that's always struck me as curious as to why improvement seems to sit on the side sometimes. Um, and I've discovered a white paper by the IHI some while ago called Sustaining Improvement. And they've since written another paper after that around whole management quality systems, which is worth looking at if you can. And that led me into the work of um, quality management systems. So if I could have the next slide, please. So I wonder if this is familiar. So every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. Now I've put these three esteemed gentlemen on because each one of them has this quote attributed to them. So that's um, W. Edwards, Deming, Don Berwick and Paul Batalden. Well, each of those people are very bothered about how it is that we currently get the results we get for quality. And what their tell us is, is the system we've got is this is will give us the results we get. And what we already have is a quality management system that you work in in your organization, whether you realize it or not. Um, and where quality management systems in comes in is to start to articulate that and start to see the difference. So if you could click on for me, please. Um, and that's about how do we work from the quality as expected or imagined 
um, between the quality is provided and how do we close that gap? So what are the things that we need to do to close that gap? And this is where we've seen a problem in that increasingly organizations are expected to run two challenges, one of being resilient and consistent and reliable, and secondly, of being evolving and adapting. Um, and you see this is picked up in the IHI's paper. Sorry, I'm just keep seeing a poll jumping in front of me. This is a challenge that um, organizations have across the world in delivering quality, and particularly in healthcare. How do we get to a position where we can become excellent at changing these results and keeping them changed as our situations resolve? So this is where a quality management system comes in. So can I have the next slide, please? Okay. So Joseph Duran was one of the first people to describe this sense of a quality management system, where there's three integrated parts, three distinct processes, but they integrate together to be able to produce a high performing organization that consistently and reliably can produce its quality. And this is about taking an active planning process, moving this into daily control, um, and then improving it when it needs to and repeating that cycle. So let's move on slightly. So I'm going to take you through each part of these. This, as I say, is quite brief. Um, can you not click ahead for a second? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So quality planning. Um, so this is about how do we design quality in at the beginning? What are the things we need to do about understanding our patients and our population? How do we design a strategy that would meet those needs? And how do we garner our resources, our technology, our workforce and our environment to be able to plan to deliver the quality that we're expecting? So the question for us is, what do you need to put in place to achieve the quality that your patients and your stakeholders require? So if you can imagine, we may have feedback from our commissioners, our stakeholders, our patients, for example, that there's an accepted quality about how quickly they may access urgent care, for example. Well, quality planning is all about how do we plan to deliver that? What are the things that we need to do to get in place to plan that to happen? And as a result, then, our staff can be very clear about what's expected of us. So if I can have those two. Yeah, fantastic. So the two questions is, what do we need to put in place to design quality in? And then how can our staff be really clear about what's expected of them? So on to quality control. This is the next level um, process. So quality control is about really understanding the quality that's expected every day. So once we've designed and planned what's expected of us, quality control is about making that happen every day consistently and reliably by using quality improvement methods. Typically in healthcare, we might see this as a huddle, or we might see this as a visual control board, but it's about standardizing as much as we can, detecting emergent problems quickly, um, and take steps to resolve those problems. And where necessary, if we can't resolve that in the workplace, stepping out of the workplace to make breakthroughs in quality through quality improvement. So the question for quality control is, how do we keep our quality that we expect under control so that what we deliver is what we expect to deliver? And the question for our staff is, how well do they know how they're doing every day? How do they know that they're delivering the quality that, that they're expected to deliver? And the third part of the trilogy is quality improvement. So this is probably the bit we're probably more familiar about. Um, and that's where you step outside of the workplace um, to make a breakthrough in the quality that you're trying to deliver. And that's where you use a variety of tools and methods to analyze what you're doing, um, think about the symptoms and causes of poor quality and develop and test methods to get that better. And when you've done that, the purpose of getting to that level of improvement is you can slot that back into quality control. So the key questions are, how can you make step changes that are needed to deliver better quality? So how do you apply a systematic method to do that? And then how can your staff say, I know how to improve the quality of my care. I have the resources and the capability and the support needed to improve the quality of the care that I provide. 
So quality improvement is very much about making step changes and where the standard no longer fits or no longer works, making that adjustment. And that from quality improvement, we should be moving back to quality control. So just to show how the three parts of the trilogy work together. So if we start on the right hand side, um, if we imagine that we have a, um, a daily operations, our daily operations, and we have standards that we'd like to keep under control. So we might do that kind of work, we'll monitor it, we'll adjust it as we'll go, and we apply continuous improvement techniques to that. However, sometimes problems escalate, sometimes problems build up, and that's where we'd step outside to the left-hand side of the trilogy into quality improvement. And that's where we'd look and do some process analysis. What is it that's going differently? Where's the variation? What are the things that we'd like to change? And that's where we might do typically a plan, do, study, act cycle of change. And then we've developed our change idea, we've tested it, we've improved the design. And as you can see, that goes back into quality control. And all the time we need to be developing a continuous learning and, and feedback loop into quality planning so that we change our design as we go. We learn what works and we learn what doesn't work. And that's how we start to narrow the gap between quality as expected and quality as provided. Okay. And finally, not quite finally, almost finally, um, a little word about quality control versus quality assurance. So Duran would describe quality insurance as something that sits outside of the quality management system. So quality control is there every day. That's your internal system for be able to um, assure that quality is happening day by day. Whereas quality assurance is something that happens after the event. It's externally focused and it looks backwards. So that's where your compliance and your inspection fits in. Some will say it's all part of a whole of a quality management system and some would say it's not. But the important thing is to recognize the difference. So carrying out checklists and inspections is not the same as building in daily continuous quality control. Okay, so on to what is my final slide. Just a little word around some of the features of quality management systems. So I was lucky to lead um, a key programme taking people to high performing organisations across the country, both high healthcare and um, in independent private sector. Um, and we learned quite a bit um, about quality management systems, high performing organisations. Um, and one of our visits was to Healthcare Improvement Scotland, and they started to do some work with the IHI around the features of a quality management system. And these are the things that they pulled together, that the system itself needs to be articulated. So people understand what's that interrelation. And this is why it's helpful at an organisational level, is how does the programme management office fit in with the QI team that fits in with the operations team? What's the part we're all playing? on quality and then secondly that strategy is aligned right through so that quality planning element you can see day to day in activities that are on the front line thirdly that continuous improvement is there every single day that rather than waiting to be told there's a problem with our quality and inspect that later we know what's happening there and then on the, in the workplace Step change is prioritised and it's prioritised right from the top and resourced in that way. So if we're going to put in our effort to make improvement, we make sure that that's what we focus on and we put some resources to that rather than spreading our effort. And capability and capacity is used, um, is, is developed throughout that system right from the top to the bottom. Leadership, and we will come on to this with our celebrity interviews, is the bit that binds it all together. So that's the bit that supports and coaches that system, articulates it, brings the attitudes and the behaviours that gets it to, to work well. And the social networks that exist between people are the way in which relational change and role modelling happens. And then finally, what we're aiming to build is a learning system that happens day by day and can connect each of these different distinct procedures or approaches together so that we look that the whole organisation is strategically organised around improving quality. 
So that's very much a sort of massive run through. And I'm going to hand over to Joy now, who's going to give you a bit more of an insight into how this is developing across healthcare. Over to you, Joy. Uh, hello, everybody. Good morning. Um, I just have a frog in my throat right at this moment, so I apologise. Apologies if I cough. So, um, so what I've been thinking about really is, um, if you think about all that theory that Emma's just very kindly shared, is so what? So what? If we reflect on that, what does QMS mean for us? Then how does that? How can we bring together? quality planning, quality control, and quality improvement. Um, I'm recognising that's not quite the same thing as quality assurance. Um, and when we bring these three things together into that integrated model of quality management, it begins, for me anyway, to look like that next evolution, if you like, on the healthcare journey in terms of our maturity levels of quality. So if you look at this diagram, and, and it's not comprehensive by any means, Many of you on this call, I'm sure, will recognise some of the phases of development of quality in healthcare um, from Ernest Codman back in the 1900s, um, doing his initial work on clinical audit right through to the present day. Uh, and you can see here, as, as particularly from the 90s, we started doing a lot of work in clinical audit and professionalising that through the modernisation agency and then into the Francis and Bowen reports of the mid 2010s. And you can see how different organisations have took different parts of that as we've gone through that evolution of quality in healthcare to the more recent evolutions, really, that the, the 2016 onwards focus on building QI capacity and capability. And we see that in, in lots of organisations now um, and with the national work on the dosing formula. And now we're moving, I think, into a new level. So how do we bring quality control, quality improvement, quality planning, and to some extent, quality assurance from external bodies together? And how do we begin to de forge deliberate partnerships, if you like, to help bring all those elements together? And I think there's some really fabulous work going on. Uh, we just heard from Healthcare Improvement Scotland. There's some fabulous work at, um, in East London Foundation Trust on, on bringing, building a, a quality system if you like, and, and I think many of us will know about the work for Western Sussex, the Virginia Mason Trust, and also uh, more recently, some of the Vital Science Trusts. And I saw Kate on the call earlier, so uh, welcome to Kate. So I think for me, uh, quality management systems are a bit of the evolution uh, in terms of where, as a, an improvement community, if you like, where we might want to think about going next. So rather than separate elements, to quality really think about how they interface and how they join up together so um if we just move to the next slide please so if you think about um that for me in my organization i've been at northwest ambulance for just over a year now so some of the the things that i'm beginning to think about is how might we do that here so how do we shift the balance from from a sometimes what could be quite a reactive focus on quality and that's national as well as local where we have lots and lots of processes around quality defects if you like incidents issues complaints we've all had infection outbreaks in the last 18 months um, errors and harms so how do we start to shift that balance so we're moving left if you like we're making a left shift towards a much more proactive approach to quality. So how do we predict and prevent quality problems rather than just respond to them and learn from them? We will need both. We'll never get rid of all the issues that happen. But how do we shift left and move to a much more predictive approach to quality um, management? Um, and I think it's really exciting, one, to be on this call today. And thank you so much for all being here. We, we thought we might get 30 people. So you have overwhelmed us with your support in coming. And it's really interesting, I think, to um, to have this conversation with everybody about what are we doing well now where might we want to go um, and how can we all think about shifting less so we do shifted left so we do much better for patients yeah, thank you okay so i think we're on to a quick poll aren't we john before our celebrity interview yeah, Is that right? absolutely. yeah. absolutely emma so uh, Joriam is going to share the, the next poll with you, team. Based on Emma's descriptions of a quality management system, we're interested to sort of baseline how you see your organization's capability currently. We're going to ask these questions under the three headings. The first of those is quality planning capability. Obviously, it's subjective. 
Uh, but if you could take an option, just to remind you, quality planning is about understanding the needs. It's about a strategy to meet those needs. And then it's about designing the care practices, the environment, using the technology, and obviously having the mechanisms to manage performance and obtain feedback so that we can improve further. Uh, hopefully that recap is as helpful as you think about uh, where your own organization is. Yeah, that's interesting, lots of people developing, but yeah, equally, some people at the beginning of the, the journey. Um, the benchmark one's interesting, isn't it? You know, what, what would a recognized benchmark be in, in this context? I guess organizations like IHI and the Care Quality Commission can, can help us with that. Uh, nobody's sort of sticking their hand up in, in that space at the moment, but lots of work in, in progress, which is which is clear. Um, we're still at 50%, people ticking up. We'll let that run for another half a minute or so. Yeah, low variable is, a, is the challenge, isn't it? Um, you may be excellent in one part of the organization, but not consistently deployed across all parts of the, the organization. But yeah, clear as I would have expected. Uh, everyone's putting a lot of effort into this uh, area and, and really working hard to develop your, your system, uh, which is encouraging to, to see. Good, we're up to three quarters of the team who've participated in that, I think. Um, we'll probably move on. We'll do the, mm -hmm. the next question, please, Johnny. So now we're talking about how you evaluate your organization's quality improvement capability. So here we're talking about how able are we, the capabilities that are necessary to make step changes in our quality performance. Uh, you were thinking about the capability that we have, both our systems and people, in order to be able to analyze, to experiment, to solve, to implement. Uh, Joriam, can you move on to a quality improvement, Paul, please? Uh Sure, the, the three questions are already on screen. Oh, fantastic. Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm not seeing uh, those. Excellent, we can see that. So yeah, uh, similar answer, uh, developing capability. Super, and we've got a good level of responses on, on that. Yeah, I mean, clear we're, we're very focused on uh, getting better. It's, it's a core capability, isn't it? And uh, very much necessary in today's challenging environment. And we've got question four, yeah, quality control. Obviously, that's the part that uh, Emma spoke about, about knowing, uh, having defined standards, being able to detect quality issues. And yeah, similarly, we've got people saying they're uh, developing. It's actually, the picture is remarkably consistent across the, the three dimensions. That perhaps reflects the, <laughs> the choices that we made available. Uh, we'll look into those uh, a bit more deeply after the, the session. But yeah, it's clear equal amounts of work going into uh, all three of Duran's dimensions, Emma, from what we can we can see there. Good. I think we can probably end that poll, Jorian. Thank you. Emma, I'll hand back to you for the, the interviews. Thanks, John. That's really interesting. There's quite a good mix there. Um, some people um, being brave and putting themselves on the mature level mm. and others are uh, um, saying not evident yet. And, and one of the comments I noticed was about um, those parts might be there, but how integrated are they as a whole? And I think that's the key thing with quality management system is how does it hold together? Um, could, could you describe it and articulate it within your organization? So that's going to be um, the kind of thing that I'm going to be asking our celebrities. So um, I wondered if, um, has Andy Heaps joined us? Andy, if you've joined us, can you say hello? Not yet. No. Is he on our list? No. Well, hopefully Andy will join us any minute. We hope so. But we know that we've got Ian and we know that we've got Francis. So I'm wondering whether we could come off the um, slide for a minute um, and just say hello to Francis and to Ian. So Francis, would you like to say hello? Yeah, hello. Yep, you're there, great. And Ian, you're there too, great. Yes, so we've got, got you both on spotlight. Um, no Andy as yet, but when he comes in, hopefully he can say hello as well. Um, so um, I'd like to start off with both of you, really. If you don't mind introducing who you are, what's your experience in quality management systems? And just a little starter question. What do you think are some of the conditions for success for getting quality management systems described, develops, integrated in your organisation? And I'm going to go to Ian first. Hi, Ian. No ladies first, Emma. <laughs> Outrageous. 
Uh, well, okay. Um, Ian Smith, uh, I work uh, in the uh, the National Improvement Directorate of NHS England and Improvement. Um, in uh, Joy's previous slide, she showed um, kind of several key moments in the introduction of quality improvement, quality management systems uh, into the NHS, including Bolton, where Joy used to work, and the Northeast Transformation System, where I work for a very long time with the Virginia Mason colleagues from 2006. It, it's, I think through working in those respective areas at similar times that Joy and I uh, first met. Uh, and over the years I've worked in organizations that have tried and had some success in implementing quality management systems. And through the Northeast Transformation System, I've worked with organizations again that were trying to do that, uh, providing help and support to them to some of the things on, um, on Emma's list of what the features of a quality management system are. Francis, you can give them a, <laughs> a, a better intro than that one. Um, hello, so my name is Francis Wiseman. I'm, I'm Deputy Director of Transformation at Portsmouth Hospitals. Um, I have been here, I've been working in this role for about three years and prior to that um, I have spent um, about 10 years in operational management and then some time at, at the Health Foundation um, in a Associate Director of Improvement role. And so when I joined the trust, we were a challenged provider. We had challenges on most of our performance indicators around our safety, quality, performance, finance. And there had been a significant amount of work done to um, make improvements across the board, but very much from a compliance perspective and needing to um, shift us from um, where we were um, as an organisation and being able to move us out of that challenge provider status. And if you like, kind of, steady the ship in terms of that, bring the organisation together. A strategy was written, um, it was an organisational restructure. But when we were looking at what's the next platform and what's the next phase of our whole organisational improvement, it was absolutely the need to shift away from a compliance based and, and being able to meet and demonstrate externally that we were um, meeting those quality standards um, into a continuous improvement. So we um, did a lot of work rather than saying, right, well, now we'll write quality improvement strategy and think about how we can teach people about quality improvement, we need to do the work to understand how do we embed this in all that we're doing as an organisation. So um, we took the leadership team on um, quite a learning journey, thinking through a number of the organisations that um, Joy and Emma have shared um, to understand what did that mean for us? What did we need to be able to do to be able to um, embed continuous improvement and absolutely landed on um, thinking through a quality management system and what a quality management system means in Portsmouth about, I know what's expected of me and why, I know how I'm doing, I'm in control of my services and I know how to fix things in my workplace and I'm able to make improvements. And then importantly, as a leadership team um, and as a, the culture of the organisation that we create the conditions to be able to do that. So we've been on a huge learning journey as an organisation to start that path. We went through a market testing and tendering process to be able to find a partner to work with us on this and to give us some technical support to be able to do that work and we're um, I'd say we're probably nine months into what you would see as the kind of full-on starting the implementation of it um, but it, it was a it was a good couple of years journey to be able to get to that point and we absolutely recognize we are right at the beginning of years and years and years of work um, to implement the full quality management system within the organization but that's the, the ambition and that's the way in which we've structured our implementation and, and a way to bring this into the organization fantastic francis so if you've got questions for anybody please put them in the chat i'll try and monitor them and i'm hoping my team also tell me if there's a really good one coming up but i want us to say hello to andy as well hello andy thank you for joining us so would you mind introducing yourself and giving us a little bit of a background of your relationship with qms what have you been up to um and i was asking a quick tricky question around conditions for success but i might just come back to that one in a minute so if you could just do us a little bit of an introduction that would be great uh yeah of course hi emma good morning everyone uh, it's nice to see so many people on the call actually and lots of people i know which is even nicer um so uh, i'm andy heaps and i'm currently the managing director for west sussex at university hospital sussex um and previously i was the interim chief exec and the chief operating officer at north middlesex hospital uh, and before that, I was a, a, a jobbing obstetrician and then uh, uh, associate medical director for quality and um, divisional director at BHRUT. So um, 
uh, the uh, my background, I suppose, with quality management systems, like a few people on this call, was um, when I started the Generation Q program uh, with the Health Foundation. Um, uh, and that started around the same time that BHRUT entered into the, um, uh, the partnership with the Virginia Mason uh, uh, program. Uh, and, and I was lucky enough to go over to Seattle and see things working there, which was really helpful in terms of my understanding of lean improvement methodologies and the use of a quality management system um, to sort of make it the way you do your, your daily stuff. Um, the partnership with Virginia Mason was really helpful, uh, particularly around the tools of lean and how you use those processes to drive improvement. Uh, but I was really curious about how um, Gary Kaplan and the guy, guys at Virginia Mason had, had used that to drive the day-to-day organization, uh, the day-to-day -day running of the organization and how you turn your strategy into something that that really goes from, from board to ward. Uh, and when I was at North Mid, uh, we uh, talked to then Western Sussex about how they'd done it, because I was really interested that they had uh, seemingly lifted that and applied it in a, in a UK and English context um, and done it successfully. Uh, and I think the records, uh, the, the, the results spoke for themselves with it being a double, double outstanding um, trust. What we did at North Mid was we had to really look at the work we were doing to, um, and, and I think what we were trying to do, like lots of NHS trusts, was boil the sea. Uh, we were trying to do everything. <laughs> we were trying to please everyone. Uh, we were jumping to what the CQC wanted. We were jumping to what the, the region wanted. There were the ICS priorities. And actually my teams were frozen. They were paralyzed by all the work that was going on. Um, and the guys from Western Sussex came and coached us through what our, our big priorities were. And I think for me, the, 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 the massive power uh, of quality management systems is it forces us as leaders to choose what is important, really, really be clear about what they are. Uh, and the way we sat and thought about the words we used in our strategic themes and our, on our mission statements uh, which before I must admit I was a bit glib about, but actually making sure that every word meant what we wanted it to mean. So North Mid, a great example would be our staff surveys were not good. So one of our strategic themes in, in, in the people domain was about how do we improve staff engagement? And that that was, you know, we, we, we wanted to be top quarter of staff engagement in, in England. That was what we put as our, our challenge. And colleagues from Western came along and said, yeah, but what does that actually mean? What, what do you actually want to see? And that rigor of thinking through what will the change be that moves the dial collectively in the organization? It took us about four months as a team to, to really work out what that looked like. And I think my learning from that is lean looks really attractive as a, as a, as a quality improvement methodology and a quality management system, but it requires a hell of a lot of legwork before you even go remotely near the wards. I can see Joy nodding, so I'm happy because it feels like I'm saying the right thing, that's good. Uh, but it requires a hell of a lot of legwork as leaders. Um, and actually the biggest bit of work that came out of that was our behaviors with each other as leaders of holding each other accountable. So that once we'd agreed in the room what our priorities were, we wouldn't then go out of the room and say, yeah, but I'm actually the chief nurse and I'm really worried about this, or I'm the medical director. And you know, so, so we actually sort of uh, bound those together. That process is still underway at, at North Mid and, and being implemented. I've been really lucky then to get this post at um, a University Hospital Sussex where uh, it is several levels more mature. Um, and, and like everyone at the moment, we are going through a torrid time with the pressures at the front door, pressures on our elective recovery program. Uh, and actually, the, uh, the really refreshing thing that I've noticed, and I've been here for three weeks now, is we just we are able to fall back on that metho methodology. We've got that really safe space where we say there's a process. We know it works. It might not tick the boxes that the regulators want us to particularly do, but we know if we follow the process, if we've been really clear about the outcome we want and the things that will move the dial, then our staff will know every day what they have to do, what is their contribution. I, I guess I'll sort of um, conclude because I, I just wanted to do a bit of a quick summary like that. But the, the most powerful, my sort of aha moment with Lean was at Virginia Mason and we did a tour and I went to the deliveries incoming bay. And I thought, well, I'm going to test it here. 
because if it really is everyone's on board with it and i said to the guy who was running it i said how, how does this link with your um uh, virginia mason improvement system i went oh i'm really glad you asked took me off to his office he said our breakthrough objective is about reducing um uh, hospital acquired infection which was their their big challenge that year and he showed and it, it, there was a sort of a a line that they had drawn that, that showed the trust wide objective or the hospital wide objective all the way down to his individual objectives and the things he would do and actually the things he would do would be wearing a hairnet and wearing gloves and washing his hands three times a day and his personal objectives which lined up to that hospital level objective of it and 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 once you had that and and there was no sense from him that he thought it was a fad it was absolutely he liked it because he was clear about what his little contribution was that actually when the whole organization does it it moves the dial and i just thought if we could crack that in the nhs and we get that right it will a be a nicer place to work because we won't have people having to spin every plate under the sun and leaders like us need to protect our staff from the vagaries of the regulators and we need to say you need to trust us to do it that's part of the job but there's a clarity and for those people that say it becomes cookbook medicine and and it becomes you know we don't want to sort of do this actually it liberates it liberates people to think and improve and innovate on a daily basis uh, so it is really simple um I've, I've seen the excitement of starting it and i've seen it work in practice here and i, th I think it's such a powerful um, to, to be able to apply that is such a powerful um, uh, move forward, I think, for, for the way we run organisations. So, Andy, I'm going to ask yeah, you to cool. pause a little I'll bit, yeah, um, because you're brilliant at speaking about this, and I'm so glad that we've got you on the call, all three of you, actually. So um, there's a whole host of questions coming through the chat thick and fast, all sorts of different things between how do we engage senior leaders, what do we do about digital, what do we do about our improvement capability. Um, and I thought what I'd like to really ask all three of you, um, and I'll take you one by one, is where can people start? What might be the things that they need to do? Because we're already working in a system. We've already got something going on in our own trusts. So from your experience, um, what are the summer the good places to start or the places where you might think, do you know what, I wish we hadn't started that way. I wish we'd done something else. So what kind of learning can you share with other people um, around um, sort of going on this QMS journey and starting to think about how you integrate some of these things that are going on within your organisation in a more purposeful way? So I am going to go back to Ian, if you don't mind, Ian. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I was thinking about it this morning, the questions you sent through, and one of the thoughts in my head was, I'm, I'm not sure it matters so much where you start, so much as where you end up. <laughs> and there are debates around, do you start at the front line and work up from there, or do you start with leadership and work down from there? Uh, and there are risks to both. Uh, and in an ideal world, you'll have both happening at the same time in a coordinated way and meet in the middle. Uh, and in my experience, that doesn't happen very often. So what my thoughts on this have been recently over the last, um, the last months and the last couple of years are less about what are the, the components of a, of a quality management system, which you've summarized quite well, the features of quality management system slide, which I've got uh, on the screen. It's if, if you take that features list and put the word or the question how after it, I think that's the question to ask. Um, there's, there's been quite a lot the last few years about uh, QMS as a, as a direction of travel, mm -hmm. but there's not very much on what should people actually do and what are the practical steps that you can take to do it. Uh, and I think in, in, in Andy's uh, contributions, he's, he's covered a lot of the key things. I would boil it down to, to simple, simple things. I think the last thing that Andy said there is, is cascade of objectives. I think that's the goal. To, to get to, you're looking to be able to take what are the priorities of the organization and how do we cascade them throughout so that everybody, the guy in Andy's example, is making a contribution to the goals. And I think that, as people have said on this call earlier, that there are, there are lots of components. There are lots of things that are happening that are happening really well in lots of places. There's just relatively few. We've got all of them at once. And my thoughts over the last sort of 12 to 18 months have been, how, how do you help an organization that's stretched 
um, struggling, possibly doesn't have a lot to invest in it, to develop some of these capabilities and put things in place. And where I've got to is that I think we've got most of the key components and, and the trick is to start to use them. So I'll give some examples and some of it's already gone up in the, in the chat feed. So one of Duran's kind of descriptions on quality control is just understanding the gap between where you are and where you want to be and making some decisions about how you move forward. And what that leads me to think about is over the last two years, I think Sam Riley's done some really spectacular work on making data count and introducing boards and executive teams to use improvement tools to, to measure performance better with a view to making better decisions about what we work on. I think that's a step in the right direction to, to quality control in a quality management system sense of the word. Uh, I think quality improvement's been with us for a long time, but it's not always been connected in to the decisions that boards make. So I think building capability in that is still relevant, it's still important, it's, it's, it's always going to be, but joining it up to the decisions we make about what we need to improve is key. Uh, and Andy's example plays to that perfectly. I see some uh, things here through the boy, it's all here, but how we will bring it there? I've, I've, I've no idea, uh, but I'm just gonna carry on and hope you meet. Um, so one of the things I've seen flash past uh, in the chat, and I think um, a couple of people touched on it. I think Andy touched on this, uh, and Joy will probably know where I'm going, is, is this idea of coaching and leaders as coaches. That was one of the first ideas introduced to me uh, by Gary Kaplan when I met him in 2006. And I'm not sure I knew what it meant or how you would do it on a big scale. And I've already seen somebody put in the chat box that they're trying to use Toyota Cutter and Improvement Cutter as a framework for this. Uh, and I think that's got huge potential to start joining the dots between what decisions we make about what we need to improve as a board and how quality improvement gets enacted at the, at the front line of care. So my suggestions would be to take the things we already know and already have that, that are really good, like making data account, like improvement counter, and all of the stuff that we've got on improvement and methodology that's available to help people build capability and start building a strategy around simple components that we could do well to take uh, everyone on a, on a small step forward. And then I'd probably worry more about some of the other things after we've made a bit of progress with the basics of understanding where we wanna be, what the gap is and having a way to cascade objectives. They're, they're, that's how I kind of crystallize my thoughts of what should we do Brilliant. in the yeah. NHS right now. Thanks, wow. Um, well, thankfully, go on mute now. <laughs> thankfully, we're recording this, so I'm going to have to play that back to myself <laughs> afterwards. Thank you, Ian. Um, so, fancy similar question then. So, um, you've you've obviously embarked on um, a journey in Portsmouth about um, quality management systems, and that's been quite a deliberate one. Um, so, how did you um, decide the things you wanted to try first, and any learning from what you've done in that? Um, yeah. So, one of the, I mean, we, we'll probably be in danger of a bit of being in violent agreement across the, uh, sharing <laughs> our experiences. But one of our key learnings was, um, and some advice that we got was, do you know what, wherever you choose to start, there's gonna be a bit of you that thinks, because there's so many different places you can start, there's gonna be a bit of you that thinks, oh, I wish we'd started there, or you know, I wish we'd done something else. And there isn't a kind of a right and a wrong. And some of it will be about where does the opportunity present itself? The organizational context what feels important so for us we started having gone through the decision making that this was what we wanted to do and there's lots that i could share um you know separately about how we did that and the work that we um, did with the leadership team to get to that point but coming out of us for us coming out of the latest um covid wave we were about to stand up our business as usual governance and performance and accountability framework and things that had been on pause during um, their response to COVID and therefore there, there was a window of opportunity to think rather than standing everything up to then dismantle everything again might we use this as an opportunity to be able to think through how we then really do start with the um, setting our strategic aims our, and our strategy deployment and thinking through how we were um, able to communicate that cascade so that has its strengths and its shadow sides because of the pace that we then needed to work at to be able to do that. But that also gave us um, that platform that was right for us at the time because of context. 
But the other piece about Cascade that's really important is in an organisation of thousands of people, that there will be lots of different bits of activity going on. And even when they might feel that they're going on separately, having that cascade and that understanding about the cascade of the organisational direction and what it wants to do starts to um, help everybody sort of place where they fit in this new thing if we're talking about a new way of working as an organization and in fact whilst we talk about a couple of years of work with the leadership team we also did some small work with um, our pharmacy team where they had had nothing knew nothing about um, the work that we were going to do had had uh, we hadn't done the organizational briefings because we were just coming into i think the most recent wave um, of the pandemic and actually, in a very short time, we're able to make this meaningful for them, for them to connect it to where we wanted to go as an organisation in a way that they hadn't connected with the strategy at all um, in the past. So that experience of sort of being able to connect both at a leadership level and at a frontline level was important. And we needed to think about how do we get the balance right between sufficient um, leadership to enable support, permission, you know, people getting the getting the message, this really is going to be the way that we're going to work. And through my leadership actions, I'm going to create um, the time and the space for you to do that very deliberately, even at times of high pressure, but also enough frontline kind of results that gets excitement because not many people get excited about a governance structure or a performance and accountability framework. Um, and so what did we need to do to really kind of switch make people feel that this was meaningful it was going to make a difference they were going to enjoy it so thinking through the context was really important to be able to think about what are all the different components and being deliberate about where you start but it might it's highly unlikely to be exactly where other organizations started mm -hmm. but it does feel that the essential agreement if we're talking about a whole organization qms rather than departmental quality systems that we've seen in some of our um, support services for some time now um, that 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 the ingredient of leadership is really so important there to be able to create the conditions to support whichever kind of order of approach you might choose brilliant thank you Frances. so i'm going to go to andy next um so you've had the benefit of going from various different organizations that are all on different parts of their um, their development of QMS, any learning around, um, you know, what not to do, um, what might be some of the pitfalls as well as the things that create uh, the good conditions for success? Yeah, so I've just been making some some notes really, and there's some also some really helpful contributions coming into the uh, into the mm. chat. Um, so um, I'm going to be as generic as I can by saying this. So the organisation I was in where this absolutely, well, kind of fell over was because the chief exec and the exec team weren't committed to doing it. So I'm not gonna name it, but if, the, if, if you've not got leadership buying at the top, it is really hard because you then do get that sort of, there's a thousand priorities and you don't get that sense of prioritization. And I think I'd agree with Francis, what you, what, what you would then look at is what can you then do at a service level to create, create that system. But my big challenge out is, that, that this needs buy-in at the top of the organization because unless this is the chief exec's priority it won't be anyone's priority um and I'm, you know i've just so how do you it. make it their priority andy come well, on what's the I mean, secret ingredient <laughs> well, the thing is i suppose you need to sort of create the, the sort of slight aha moment so there is a bit about the um about demonstrating what what can happen so so i guess the if you were going to do it in an area, I think I think there's a few things. People talked about leadership. Um, I do think you need a structure, and you don't need to worry too much about the outputs, but you just need to make sure you're doing those so that leader standard work, that thing of every day. I'm going to walk out to the gamba. I'm going to go and see. I'm going to ask questions. I'm going to show respect. You know, it's going to be in my diary. Nothing's going to move. I'm going to go and talk. You know, it's the most important thing that I will do that day. Um, that that is so key. And and when leaders get distracted off with other things. People who are you you are supporting to work through this think you don't take it seriously, and so they won't take it seriously. So that that demonstration is is important. Um, I think um, it's really important that QI isn't just for doctors, and there's a bit of a risk in the NHS <laughs> that QI is just for doctors, and QI projects on people's blood banana count because that's what that person's <laughs> interested in. So actually, starting to try and line up some of these things so that you're starting to look to a common. Um, uh, a, a common um, output. 
I, I, two two lines here that really so be purist but not too purist so that that there is a structure and a sort of a set of rules around a quality management system that you've kind of got to lean into but don't let it hoist you up and and get too tied up in it i think being as being quite general is is you know good enough is good enough really in terms of but what are your monthly weekly daily processes that mean that you check in on this and you, mm. you you make sure that you are taking it seriously. So there is something about Ian's mentioned um, that coaching leadership style, and that's really hard in the NHS. It's really hard because an email will come in saying, "I want this by five o'clock," and yeah, everyone pulls on their cape and they go all command and control <laughs> again, instead of actually sort of saying, "Look, guys, come on, you're the guys at the work for at, at the coalface. You're doing the work. How can how can we work through this? We'll buy you some time to do it." I, I, look, the final point is, um, I don't think we give people permission to fail enough in the NHS. We learn from things when things go wrong, and people don't don't and people don't like it. And we need to celebrate failure because at least we've tried and, and we've we've seen something something through. The Friday report out at Virginia Mason, where you know whether things have gone well or gone badly, a session where the chief execs in the room and and that that learning is being celebrated this is about the learning that's coming out of it not necessarily the output is such an important key bit we don't have that right where i am at the moment that's the bit that we need to sort of mm. work on and do but there is something about that just making people see how relevant what they're doing in that sort of process is to the outputs is so key okay thanks andy so that's absolutely huge amount of questions coming through the chat which I have no chance of um, being able to take in and understand as we're going along um, but um, I'm hoping that the um, participants would be able to either answer each other or some of our guests could answer them after this little session um, there's a huge amount of different papers and things you can also look at as well so we'll make sure that we put that in with the webinar I just wanted some final words off each of you really um, just thinking about um, the kinds of um, organisational maturity um, you need to be developing and where does, how, what are some of your uh, words around um, developing the right kind of leadership and how could people do that? What's the, um, how do you lead from where you are in your organisation? Because this takes a little bit of a change, doesn't it? It takes somebody to be able to step, stick their neck out and say, actually, I want us to start doing something different. So I just wondered what kind of words of encouragement or insight um, or lessons learned, really, that you'd like to share with the, um, the people that are on the call with us um, and, um, and, and sort of share with you how, how would you start as a leader where you are starting to um, bring other people with you and starting to explain this and, and, and take them in. So I'm going to go back to Ian again, if you don't mind, Ian. I don't mind at all. Um... So I think ways to sum it up as uh, something to kind of take away and there might be an addition to this to, to answer your question but um, I think we should talk about failure less and talk about experimentation and learning more uh, and even if you are in the middle of the organization and you're trying to influence out whether you're trying to influence up or, or to the side you could use that framing to talk about well, okay can we experiment with this can we try something and try and leave failure alone? Because if we talk about experimentation and learning, I think that's a, it's a safer framing than failure, perhaps in the NHS. Uh, and this, it, this is all bound up in learning and learning organizations uh, and quality management systems are kind of connect the whole organization together to learn and improve towards a set of specific goals. So maybe that's something that we can take away as a different kind of frame. Thanks, Ian. Thank you. Francis. Um, so I think there's a there's a real range of people on this call and a range of people who will feel that they have different ability to influence um, and be a, and be leading um, and the people that they're leading. Um, the when we were talking about quality management systems and wanted to think about how we spoke to the whole organization about this, I think I said earlier that we boiled it down and, and Emma you were involved in in this work too about being able to say so rather than talking about quality planning quality control quality improvement making it feel that it was kind of quite a technical thing being able to say 
I know what's expected of me and why, so relating to the cascade of those objectives. Um, I know how I'm doing and I'm in control of my services, so I understand um, how I'm doing and I'm able to improve things. And almost whatever leadership role you're in, whether you're leading an improvement team, leading an operational team, leading the whole organisation, what can you influence and how can you create the conditions for your team to be able to answer those questions? And I think that's different for a chief executive. That's absolutely about mm -hmm. um, saying, actually, this is how we want the whole organisation to be. But even if you're not currently in an organisation which has taken the whole step in terms of like the whole organisation is going like, to line up at the start line and step on this whole quality management system, them, how can you look at connecting the current activities to where the organization is going giving people the time and the skills and supporting them with the skills to really understand their services rather than receive reports on somebody else talking to them about their services and thinking through the improvements to be able to plumb them back into the things that we're saying are the priorities we want to improve and I think trying to apply those principles of course if it's in within one team it's not going to mean that the whole organization, can change because of that one, but I think you can apply the principles of quality management system mm. um, at that level and, and have a much clearer narrative for people about how to be able to create that, even if, um, despite the way that maybe the whole organizational system is working, doesn't allow that. So yeah, we want to shift. If we have despite the system and because of the system at two ends of the spectrum, we absolutely want to shift closer and closer to because of the system. But if you're feeling like you're down right at the beginning, or right at the bit of despite the system, actually, how can you create those principles of a quality management system within the areas that you can lead and influence? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Francis. So, Andy, just any final words from you? I really like Francis' answer, so I'm going to be watching the recording back so I can <laughs> write something. Um, so, um, I, I, I tell you what, I think the um, my biggest bit of advice would be to look internally at your own leadership style. Um, and and the best way I think about it is 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 that sort of oft used phrase servant leadership, which is how do you turn yourself into a leader that is helping people improve versus telling what people what they need to do every day. Uh, that was a bit of a journey for me. Uh, it was a bit of a difficult journey from being a sort of a gobby bossy superhero uh, <laughs> consultant. Um, and and I don't do it right every day, and I have to check in with myself every day on it. But but there is something about you know, um, role model, role model it out. Um, and, and I think that's the, you know, these things, it's like that video of someone dancing on a hill. If someone starts, it will start to sort of, it will start to capture. So uh, I, I would encourage you to, to sort of turn that question internally. Thank you, Andy. Well, I want to say a huge thank you to our panel. Um, that was absolutely brilliant. It's lovely for you to speak so honestly and openly as well, because I think the more we can share um, some of our thoughts and experiences, the better, really. Um, and I encourage you to, to sort of keep in touch with us all. Um, so I'm going to close this part of our um, webinar. So thank you very much. I think Andy might have to leave us. So thank you very much, Andy. Um, thanks, Francis. Thanks, Ian. Um, and I'm going to hand over to John now, who's going to take us through um, a little bit of a presentation around um, the future of quality management systems based on um, work that he's um, done and experienced. He's got vast amounts of experience working across different organisations and sectors. Um, so, John, are you ready to um, take us forward? I am indeed, Emma. I must say, before we even start, how inspired I am by the conversation today. And in particular, I mean, the, the, there's massive value in that uh, chat thread going by. I, I'm, I'm actually struggling because I want to listen so much to what Francis and even Andy have to say. And I'm also fascinated by, <laughs> by what's going on in the, the chat. But yeah, I, I hope I can uh, continue to, to add to the debate. Uh, I've been a lifelong learner in this subject. I did a degree in engineering and then my master's project was on team-based work systems and their uh, impact and quality and improvement. Um, I'm not going to bang on about industry. I'm just going to try and give you some insights of, of, about QMS. And they probably do align somewhat with the stages of my career. I've, I've obviously been in manufacturing. I did a decade from engineer to GM. I think in the context of today, my most relevant role was as a global quality order, uh, auditor. Uh, that was on the quality and continuous improvement system for Cummins. I certainly always seen QMS and improvement as a means of competitive advantage. Worked with some really talented people and, and won some awards. But I think in the context of today's discussion, maybe the first sort of learning insight is 
you know, we were achieving very low defect levels, very high levels of quality. And I think that always stuck out to me at that time was the correlation between quality and safety. It was no surprise to us that a very high quality performance would also lead to a very high level of safety performance. The cultures, the systems, the behaviours, the leadership style, there's so many similarities there. And for us in a healthcare setting, obviously we think about patient safety and we think about our QMS. So, you know, it's essential that um, we understand that, that one will beget the, the other. I think as uh, the discussions ranged uh, today, you know, it's clear we're, we're talking about quality control, quality planning being much more than returns to the regulator. And, you know, although I'm going to come from an industrial perspective here, I'm not going to bang on about making widgets. The only thing I'll say is making widgets is not easy. And when I reflect on our approach to quality planning in particular and quality control, I think the thing that I, I realized looking back is how deep an understanding that we had of how we delivered our products and services. You, know, you mentioned them and knowing, having a defined standard, knowing what's okay, what's not okay. That was really clear. In fact, it was even classified. So not only good or bad, okay, not okay, but critical, major or minor. If it goes wrong, what's the impact to the customer? In this case, obviously, our, our patient. We did that classification characteristics. We used techniques like failure modes and effects and analysis. And so there was real rigor around that quality control and quality planning. I think it really speaks to what Joy said about that preventive stance as opposed to that reactive stance. I think the next thing that I, uh, I thought about with that planning, we then had quite a deep understanding of our process capability. And I mean that in a statistical sense, the frequency and ability of our processes to achieve the required uh, outcomes. So that was the, the sort of six sigma uh, mentality. We measured that, we controlled it, we sought to uh, improve it. And part of that was having the correct measurement systems. Uh, lots of uh, input from uh, people like Andy around how we measure, how that drives performance. You know, the capability of our measurement systems was actually as important as the capability of our processes. The right things measured the right way with the right measuring uh, techniques uh, so that we can get the right feedback on time and we can make the difference. So I think the principle was also this idea of making quality control visible, see through. Uh, what I mean by that is understanding the status of the, the, the process and the service at a glance, at a given moment. So even someone who walks in who's not familiar can understand. And I think as a patient, as a family member, when I walk into uh, kind of care settings in the UK, I think it's fair to say that level of quality control is not as transparent and visible to me in healthcare as it would have been in an industrial context. Just to give you some quick examples of, of what I sort of mean by that, you know, we've talked a lot about Huddle, hugely powerful tool. You know, I think the ability to tell at a glance is today a good day or a bad day. You know, days are around the wheel, safety, quality, performance, uh, cost, and people. Uh, and if today's not a good day, can we drill in? Can we understand the issues that we've had? Can we see the peritos and critically, can we see the problem solving that the teams are undertaking to, to address that? I think we talked a lot about, uh, the, the panel talked about, you know, taking away the sort of fear of failure and having a, a culture that's very much aligned to this. And certainly one of my favourite authors on this subject, a guy called Stephen Spear, he talked about swarming and solving problems. And, you know, in industry, we have this culture of, of stop the, the line. I use that very advisedly in a healthcare context because clearly, you know, we have to continuously provide care, but the mentality and the courage to identify a problem stop a small problem becoming a big problem and deal with that early. And certainly there was a strong uh, reliance, a strong emphasis on this idea of no repeat occurrences. You know, when we'd moved beyond the planning and control and we were into improvement, mistake proofing, error proofing, real root cause analysis was critical. And it's telling, I couldn't really find a good picture actually of this in a healthcare context. I actually don't think the classic kind of medication tray really constitutes mistake proofing or, or a permanent resolution. And I think it's, it's an area that we could do more of in, in healthcare. And finally, you know, Stuart and uh, SPC, Statistical Process Control, got this right. I think it's just important to say that, you know, we can control attributes of a service, things which are okay or not okay, in the same way as we control measurable uh, variables. And so, you know, uh, I sometimes see SPC charts uh, in healthcare, but not often. And I think, you know, there, there's often masses of sources of variation and Regaining control, earning the right to improve, as starts with having stable uh, processes. So, uh, key area there. 
Having had uh, a decade in, in industrial manufacturing, I had 15 years with the privilege to work with a whole range of, of organizations. And I think it's fair to say they were probably in more highly regulated and, and higher risk environments, places like uh, Seller Field doing nuclear fuel reprocessing, doing Ray doing decommissioning. And in the REF, where the patient was a sick aircraft and we had to make it uh, airworthy, I think one of the most inspiring stories uh, was the uh, NHS, in particular blood and, and transplant. Uh, Joy uh, Funnel was actually on the call, was involved in this. And I think what stands out to me about that quality improvement, yes, they, they achieved an incredible productivity boost, delivered lots of savings to the front line, but the point of emphasis for me here really is about the capability development. Uh, there's some quotes here from Clive and, and Linda, but what stands out to me is uh, Toyota would say build people and then build cars. NHSBT uh, did a tremendous job of building the capability of their team. And I've seen a few notes about should we build capability? We have short-term objectives. I honestly think the two can go hand in hand. We can take a progressive approach because this should be about learning by doing. Uh, so yes, we'll build capability, but we should expect to see results as we go along. So in those other environments, what, what did I learn about QMS? I think it gave me the confidence that these principles of QMS that Emma out, uh, outlined, they apply everywhere, but most people believe they're different. And so most of my coaching and my training was helping people understand how to apply these principles in their context. I think the other thing that I saw relative to my experience in industry was I quite often saw strong quality planning and control, or I saw strong quality improvement. I rarely saw both together. And I think uh, Dr. Duran got it right with his three-legged still. Lose a leg, it's going to fall over. And certainly, I would say probably the nuclear industry was the clearest example of this, where a very strong quality control culture and system actually impeded QI. It was an overdone strength in, in that industry. We can understand the reasons why, but it certainly wasn't in, in balance. So I think if I look at where teams have generated quality improvement and where they've delivered you know, fundamental improvement in service delivery, I think understanding end-to-end -end processes, care pathways is, is critical. In my experience, a lot of the defects that we see occur at the interfaces between organizations at an event I'll never forget was looking at delayed discharge and an award. And we were mapping out all of the things that had to happen in order to get that patient safely home. The number of different organizations that were involved in, in making that happen, huge opportunity to improve uh, our quality in that area. But the thing that always motivated me and, and the thing that put a huge smile on my face was that uh, no matter the scenario, no matter the starting point, people always have the, the solutions. And it's amazing how simple methods can really make <laughs> incredible uh, results. So I've loved the kind of uh, comments in the chat about, you know, start today, do what you can, use, you know, uh, be where you are. That's, that's what matters to me. I think getting started is the, is the most important thing. Just on sort of origins and perspective, we've talked a bit about uh, Duran, Emma uh, led with that. Uh, I like Deming's take on this, that improving quality will automatically improve productivity. It's a, it's a chain reaction. One of my quality gurus is a guy that I promise none of you will ever have heard of. His name was Joe Riley. <laughs> he was a quality supervisor in, in Cummins. And Joe's old line was, there's never time to do it right, but there's always time to do it again. And, and that really stuck with me. So getting your quality planning done, having your quality control disciplines, being in that preventive space that, that Joy pointed to, I think is important. And if there's one thing I believe, it's that improving patient experience is the same as improving organization and performance. We're not exclusive. We're not going to do one at the expense of the other. Uh, we can do both together. And I think the acid test for us in our systems, our culture is when problems do occur, What's our kind of our automatic reaction? Do we add steps into the process or do we take steps away? Uh, much more commonly, in my experience, steps are added and so processes atrophy, they degrade over time. So in actual fact, we need to have an element of quality improvement just to sustain that base level of, of performance. So I love the idea that we should solve problems at the lowest level possible and the highest level necessary. That implies having the, the leadership and the support, but equally involving the people who do the work to improve the work. And I don't have time to talk through these in detail, but Deming did some great work around where problems arise and where they can be solved. And what's good news is that the majority of problems are management owned and can be solved at a low level in the organization where we have 
the most horsepower. So, you know, Google the seven basic quality tools, you're probably using them already. But what's incredible is the results that you can get even using the most basic tools. If you apply them rigorously, bring a knowledgeable team together, you'll always deliver benefit, especially if you're rigorous enough to, to implement and improve. I'm fascinated by some of the discussion in the panel about methodology. I think there's a correlation between the levels that problems can get fixed and the type of methods that we can imply. You know, Huddles and Cat are great for those lower level pathway Kaizen, PDSA mid-level using strategy deployment to manage the, the sort of tougher nuts, the big rocks that we need to, to crack. I think finally, you know, around how we, we do this, I think the thing that I've learned is really know why is as important as know how. And focusing on the principles is, is massively important. There's a great BMJ article that, that jumped out to me in my research for the call today. And it was the idea that, you know, these QMSs, they're a means to an end. They're not an end in themselves. Let's not be sort of feeding the, the beast. This is about making measurable improvement. And the principles that they outlined really resonated with me. Consistent method, empowering staff, using data, scaling and iterating. Uh, that point about an iterative process is really what Ian was saying about experiments and learning. Hugely important and something that I'd like to, to emphasize. And you know, when I look at um, the organizations that I was working with and others that I benchmarked that were succeeding, I think the most effective uh, transformations in quality I've really focused clearly on defining and teaching and applying these principles. It should be a short book. In five to 10 minutes, people should be able to understand what the quality management systems intended to do. To Andy's point, it should cascade those goals so I understand what I can do at the point of impact. And it should bring with it this massive emphasis on the capability development of the, the team. You know, I think in terms of results, I was always taught and the way that I used to audit was you, you couldn't even pass the exam simply by having a well-defined system deployed across the organization. Ultimately, it was about results and we had to demonstrate long run uh, trend based improvement on measures that made a difference to the customer and in this case, the, the patient. So really, ultimately, the acid test for the QMS was in its effectiveness. And in actual fact, PDSA applied to the QMS itself. If it wasn't proving to be effective enough, when then it in itself uh, may need improvement. I've loved the debate on leadership, on culture. Uh, I think Deming's 14 points, uh, a bit like a, an ABBA or a Beatles album, they've stood the test of time really well. I think much of what uh, we've discussed has been under that heading of, of Institute Leadership. I love the idea that transformation is everyone's job. And, you know, yeah, there's lots to, to like about this. Um, you can go and read about it uh, online if you haven't already, but uh, you could do worse than follow some of those uh, mantras in, in your QMS. So what's the future? Uh, the sort of third phase of my career in, in Changeway is enabling uh, this type of improvement through technology, this type of quality management through technology. It's never going to be a silver bullet, but I think it is critical. In actual fact, the Health Foundation state collaboration is an essential component of learning and development. So what does it look like? I think, you know, as we look to the, the future, it's incredible what's happened over the last 18 months, the behavioral, the technological changes, notwithstanding the lawyer who <laughs> turned up as a cat, you know, we've got grandparents uh, turning up on, on Zoom to spend time with their family. But what's next, I don't think is, is driven about COVID, you know, no matter uh this disease we're going to beat it um but ultimately the way that we work together uh, is not going to go back to the way it was i like this idea of the mirage of the finishing line and I actually see that as a positive we've learned a lot about how to collaborate how to improve uh, how to work remotely and i think actually building on that we can actually set our sights higher uh, we can leverage that we we should the human race typically you know through a period of enormous change like this will not revert back to to how it was it, it will move on and i think i noticed some of the the comments in the chat about the impact of technology is that a prerequisite for a, a successful qms or, or vice versa I think I was a partner in IBM for three years, uh, the latter stage of my consulting career. And I think if I understood one thing, it was about how much, uh, how valuable a change data is to an organization and commonly how undervalued it is. So do we have the ability to gather our quality knowledge, to capture it, to unlock it, and to gain insight? There are so only so many different care pathways, only so many operating theaters and, and A&Es, uh, only so many different primary care settings. How powerful would it be if we could bring that data together, uh, share and learn? And so my outlook has really been shaped by the fact that beyond the sort of digital collaboration tools that many of us are using now, where we've overcome the challenges of not being able to be together physically, 
I think in order to improve in the next stage, we need to get, uh, we need to do the work digitally. Uh, we need to bring it together in a platform, have that platform support our execution and critically bring our data into one place because there's no question where we're going to end up is with this idea of augmented improvement. If we have a change data and a quality data together, why can't we point uh, analytics and AI at that? The whole idea should be that we can learn faster so we can improve faster. It's happening in finance, it's happening in insurance. AI has obviously uh, been applied in, in areas like radiography and, and imaging uh, to diagnose and, and read scans. Why can't we apply that same idea to the change data that we have? I'd love to be able to see teams in the future. You know, we've seen that symptom of that problem before. We understand the root cause. Other organizations have tried these solutions. Uh, you know, we see scenarios uh, of AI where it can actually predict a probability of, of success. And so, yeah, you know, what we're building is designed to support that top-down quality planning, the quality improvement workshop that gives a step change. And ultimately the daily quality control that we need to sustain and manage the, the benefits. So in closing, I think, uh, you know, as we look at the, the future, using digital tools uh, simply as a way to overcome those physical barriers, that's leaving a lot of value on the table. I think the real prize with digital harnessing our change and quality data, sharing that knowledge and using it to improve faster. And there's going to be huge rewards for uh, us uh, in terms of our patients and our society when we start to, to do that. So forward looking, um, but definitely what sort of motivates me and, and what I'm working on personally at the at the moment. Thanks very much for, for listening. Uh, that concludes uh, what I have to say today. I'll uh, stop sharing the, the screen and uh, take any questions that, that come up. Thank you very much, John. Um, so we've got time for a couple of questions um, if we need them. So if anybody wants to stick their hand up to ask a quick question, and then what we will do is give you a bit more time to reflect. That was yeah, a very, George. a very massive, rapid run through quality <laughs> management systems elsewhere. My brain is already overflowing. Um, so I just want to check. Um, I don't think we've got any immediate questions coming out. So I, I, what I would suggest we do, John, um, is we've given loads of information to people. Um, they've heard lots of people speak. I think it's now time for people to be able to um, have a little chat with a smaller group of people about what they might have um, taken from some of this and what might their immediate thoughts be. So, um, uh, Horiam, have you got um, the slide on the breakout? Oh, I'm, I'm not manning the... Oh, it's Richard's the, the slides. Yeah, Richard can, oh, uh, can put that up. I can help you away. with that. Uh, <laughs> Emma, just, uh, so the question <laughs> we're going to debate today is, yeah, based on your personal experience and, and as I said, reflecting on what you've heard, simply, what are your thoughts? Uh, and, you know, let's talk about where it's inspired us, where it's motivated us. Let's equally address some of those challenges. Uh, and if there's any ideas for future sessions, we'd, we'd love to do that. Joyum is going to break us out randomly into teams. I think there's going to be eight people per team. What we'd love you to do is please appoint one scribe in the, the room. So somebody could be fairly conscientious, make some notes about the key discussion points. We're going to try and consolidate and distill those for you and share them with you after the, the fact. And actually, what we're really hoping here is that some of that debate, some of your insights, may inform some future sessions that we might run together. We're hoping we can identify some, some common topics that are going to enable us to uh, yeah, define, as I say, what some future sessions with Q community could, could be. So yeah, you've had lots of ideas, lots of discussion, time for you to, to discuss. We have uh, allocated a good 20 minutes of this and we're actually ahead of time. So uh, 20 minutes and then perhaps Joy and Emma we can get a couple of feedback from, from a couple of team members who, who'd like to, to summarize their, their thoughts. But if you're clear on the, the topic, I'm going to ask Joriam to, to break us out. We'll reconvene at uh, 11.50. And I see critically, you would do as a great service if one person could capture the, the kind of key points of the chat. We, we really don't want to, to miss that learning opportunity team. So please do that uh, for us. Joriam, I'll hand over to, to you to, to break us out. All right, you folks should see uh, the little invitation.
Are we live to the whole room, uh, Jorim? Or are people now in breakout? Okay, so I think we've got people coming back into the room, as far as I can see. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, that was great fun. I enjoyed it in my room. I hope other people did. It was really, really good to have a little chat and a, a discussion. Um, I know a few people have left us because um, uh, they've had to go elsewhere, but we will put as much information as possible and the slides and everything on the Q website. Um, and we're hoping that we might be able to run some further sessions just to sort of develop our discussions and thinking longer. Um, so I'm not sure whether Joy's back yet. Is she back? You know, I was thinking we probably do have time to perhaps hear from a couple of the breakout uh, groups, just a couple of minutes. Uh, oh, okay. We'll yeah, talk. no problem. Um, yeah. We, we, we've got five minutes before uh, Joy is going to close the session. So not to put people oh, on the spot, okay. but if anyone's comfortable to, to share a few uh, bits of feedback from uh, the breakout, we could certainly invest the next uh, three to five minutes in, in doing that. Okay. Anyone want to stick their hand up and have a go or unmute themselves? Um, I'm quite happy to if um, we were group nine. Yeah, Alison, go um, ahead. And, yeah. And we have to leave in a few minutes, so it would be good just to get ours done. So um, we were saying that actually it was fabulous to be in a, in a room full of like-minded people with and being able to be, we were all very invigorated by the 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 conversation however even we got overwhelmed by it and the learning from that maybe is that when we get excited about a quality management system we need to be mindful of how we communicate that to the people that we're trying to embed and, and um, empower um, so that was a quite a big learning I think for all of us um, the three elements of the quality management system there was a question within our group around um, whether that still is in the case, whether we still find it as three or whether we are embedding it. Um, and um, we've, we said we felt that varied very much by <coughs> the level of financial rigor that was being asked of the organization. So when the organization was in financial special measures, the level of quality improvement was less and more efficiency control was more um, and therefore the engagement of the executive leadership was very much dependent on their level of financial rigor. Um, so cost improvement tended to take over from quality improvement. Um, the need for accountability and um, people making excuses and not actually being held to account was crucial in, in, in performance and actually delivering. And that was something that we all felt was that came out over some, especially your speech, John. Um, the critical importance of leadership um, and strategy development and the involvement of quality improvement within that strategy development is very important to be embedded um, to make sure that quality improvement isn't just an add-on. Um, mm -hmm. And then data flows and interpreting the huge amount of data that's being um, pulled on our behalf or given to us or taken from us yeah. and actually enabling that to be able to make um, um, relevant deci um, decisions and lastly the external factors you know the CQC COVID really have thrown a spanner in the works in yeah. terms of some very very um, ambitious plans that perhaps aren't haven't been delivered so that was us that's very useful Alison thank you very much uh Emma, maybe time for one more and then Joyce, yeah. can I, just a couple of minutes if anyone's willing to speak up or equally we can jump in. I think in Bruce, is waving. Yeah. Bruce yeah. is waving. Oh, hi, Bruce is waving. I'm <laughs> waving. Waving, not drowning. Um, yeah, there, 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 was, there, was, there was a comment about the, you know, I think you, John, you said that the, the three legs of the stool take one away. Well, I think there was a comment about an uneven three-legged stool. <clears throat> um, someone from Scotland was talking about um, too much emphasis on the QI part, or sorry, on the improvement part, uh, and less of an emphasis on the, and on the other parts. And that made me think about, and there was a comment about, is there something that uh, people can check themselves against, either going to see um, you know, other places that are doing, have a balanced way of doing this, or even have a description of what that looks like as a way of looking at gaps. You know, mm -hmm. I can see that I'm strong mm -hmm. on the improvement side, but I can see now why I'm not so strong on the quality planning and what that gap is and, you know, con con you know, con you know constructed of. 
Um, I made the point about, I, I think, and this comes from my previous experience, car industry and all the rest of that, but then into healthcare about um, a quality management system. One part of it is bringing together um, audit and CIP and, P and PMO functions, bringing them closer together. I don't know if it means to combine them, but certainly bringing them closer together in the whole of the, the triangle. Um, and I think OD is a part of that as well, because you often see that trusts are OD departments are going to do a, a listening thing. Uh, mm. And that will also play into what, what, what are the gaps that we can improve? Um, yeah. So yeah, that, that was a couple of things. Thanks, Bruce. Um, and I know Adele had her hand up apparently. Adele, do you want to quickly give us your two pennies? <laughs> uh, two, two pennies, I'll be very quick. Um, Thank you. Great conversation with my, my colleagues um, from Bristol and Gloucester. Um, fantastic. Uh, not an unfamiliar approach. Presentations, great today. All of the presentations. Uh, John, yours as well. Brilliant stuff. Just re-energizes you and refreshes you and, and helps you think again about what it is that you're doing. Um, we're all doing elements of it, some more than others. Um, some have done more elements of it than they are doing now, uh, myself included. Um, Love the bit about how we focus on priorities and, and um, Marianne Griffith's comment about that you know you can't get cigarette paper between um, the team members so that they understand what their priorities are. The work and effort that goes with that into that is really important. We talked about the self, the inward self, um, and how you change your own behaviours um, and and um, you know show respect out there within your uh, community and to your colleagues and think about very carefully the words you use and uh, the way you write emails um, the level of respect you you demonstrate and um, when you're out on the game but it's so so important we had another conversation about coaching um, and uh, uh, the the colleagues from Gloucester were talking about you know they're an emerged organization so uh, and I took over a new I was experiencing taking over a new contract into a an organization that ran QMS and how do, how do you develop that and share that when people are still unsure about their jobs, when people are still competing for position. Um, so how, how do you get overcome that competitiveness to, to actually start and make this regular uh, behavior mm. and how you change to do that together? That's about OD, it's about your behaviors again. Um, and we talk very much again about that coaching element, where that coaching comes from. And I think I've been struggling um, to understand in a regional role, um, uh, having come from provider land um, for the whole of my career, what the added value of region um, is in this space. Um, and, uh, you know, where region can uh, do uh, and support the coaching. You know, every region has a regional improvement hub. Um, uh, you know, they're led by people like me. Um, so, you know, can I go out there and can I coach? Um, I probably can't do it Kata. I would go to Joy to say, Joy, come and help me. Um, <laughs> but I, I can bring, you know, 30 odd years of coaching in a QI context uh, into that in an unstructured way. So, so the regional improvement hubs, I think, are there to help. Um, I think there's something for me also about how you sustain when you've got ever-changing leadership in the NHS and how mm, you sustain yeah. this That's a in tricky the NHS. One. A very tricky one. Um, mm. And I think um, I haven't cracked that. Um, but I've, <laughs> seen, I've seen it. Um, I've seen the consequences of changing leadership when that change in structure, that QMS just completely goes because that's not that chief exec's responsibility. Mm. Um, and it results in a mass exodus from that organisation. Well, I'm going to have to stop that? you there, I'm afraid. They are massive <laughs> questions. And the, the one about region alone, I think, could be a whole seminar on its own, couldn't it? it? Um, <laughs> but, but thank you. It shows the richness of the discussions. I'm so pleased to hear that. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Joy now because she's going to finish us off, <coughs> um, hopefully with some little words of insights or wisdoms. Thanks, Joy. Okay. Yeah, so um, hello, everybody. Thank you for all staying with us for this long. It has been a a good two hours of discussion, but we are getting to the end now. So, so if you've not all had to switch camera off and speak and go to the room, just hold on for another 10 minutes while we wrap up. Okay, so it's my job then trying to summarise um, the rich discussion from today. And I suppose, I, I hope that uh, we, we, we call together some theory and a good introduction maybe to quality management systems. We were conscious that we would get a real range of um, knowledge in the room, and I think that was the case. So hopefully there was a bit for everybody in what we've offered there. Um, and we've really covered, you know, the Durand Trilogy, quality planning, quality control, and quality improvement. And we've heard about some of the challenges um, around that. How do we know if our staff know the plan? How do we know 
well, how we're doing every day and how do we know where we have gaps and what we need to work on to improve and how a quality management system really brings that together. Um, and we've really reflected on how quality control and quality improvement are not always aligned and are not always in balance in healthcare. And that perhaps as a community of improvers largely on this call, we too haven't always paid enough attention to the quality control element of that trilogy. Um, I've said this probably work for us to do as a community to help our colleagues in that area to help to help improve things for patients and I think there were some great comments in the chat there's probably learning within pockets of healthcare particularly from laboratory medicine and from radiology areas where quality management systems have perhaps been established for much longer and some of the challenge for all of us might be about how do we scale those systems how do we build on those learnings in those departments and in those professions out across other parts of the system and organisation. Uh, but we've also heard a lot uh, from our lovely celebrity guests, Ian, Francis um, and Andy. So thank you very much to them. And we've heard the challenge of, of how you might lead some of that effort to bring improvement, quality control and um, quality planning together. Um, I'm thinking, I think we all heard uh, very resonantly about the challenge about boiling the sea. So all of us have seen the returns that we have to give to region and now, oh my goodness, how long are these returns? But if we're really doing this in a, in a quality control way, what's the priority on those returns? What do we really need to be focusing on and what are our priorities and how are we gonna bring that together? Um, so how do we get much more deep and narrow? Um, how do we get much more specific and how do we get much more aligned? And how do we get aligned much more collectively across an organisation and increasingly across integrated care systems? And I suppose I was reflecting around that word integration, because in a sense, we've got an integration agenda, haven't we now as QI leaders and QI community members? Because how are we going to integrate what we do with the wider organisation on quality control and quality planning? So yeah, we've got to build integrated care systems, but we too have something to do in our practice around integrating, around leading up the quality. So um, we heard about some of how we might do that, the importance of leader standard work, of gamble walking, of, of listing, and of leaders role modeling, taking it seriously. If we turn up, other people see us turn up and therefore carry on doing the hard stuff, the wearing the hair net, even though everybody else out there in coffee shops isn't doing that anymore we're still doing that stuff. Um, and we also heard about how we might need to uh, continue to build the conditions uh, around leading for improvement and about delivering improvement. How do we help people have that permission to try stuff out and when it doesn't work, learn to fail and learn to prevent it happen again? How do we uh, create the conditions so that staff do know what they're aiming for every day? That, that quote is fantastic, that um, those three things aiming for what do I need to do? And do I know how I'm doing and how am I going to improve it? And that can work right across, can't it? From a patient safety perspective, a staff safety, patient perspective, quality and performance. We heard from John on learning from the private sector and um, how to really develop strong processes. And I see lots of questions in chat, but yeah, yeah, that's private sector. Private sector back in the, in the 50s and 60s was arguably where healthcare was in the 2000s. You know, that hard work of trying to articulate a standard, trying to unpick chaotic processes, trying to cope with workforce challenges, that, that has been gone through in the private sector. They're just as regulated. And it is a bit of a myth, actually, that somehow the private sector is different. It really, really isn't. Uh, just different customers, different processes, and perhaps not quite the life and death, you know? Um, although if you're an engineer for a bridge and you might kill 30,000 people, you might not think that. Um, so I think there is a bit of a, an agenda for us all really about how we bring the balance of quality control, the quality improvement, the quality planning in all its forms of strategy and healthcare together. I think there's a bit of a call to action about all of us about helping to think about what's our next step as a community to bring that together, what's our experiments we need to do to bring that together. And I think I just wanted to end with a, a, what's our next step as individuals on this call? What might we go away and do? And think about trying out and thinking about what we might learn from our next step on quality management systems and you know what wouldn't it be great if at one of these future calls we have some people beginning to share their learning from some of those experiments and i i saw an earlier thing about some examples well we're a bit sparse on qms examples in healthcare we've got some in labs and radiology we could perhaps share 
but it wouldn't it be great if we started to have some embryonic healthcare quality management systems at organisation system level. So hopefully I did a good summary there. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much, Joy. Lovely. <laughs> now, I think if I'm right, John, we're ending with a little poll, aren't we? I think. Is that right? Was that, is that a yes or a no? That's a, uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think uh, we're definitely going to, we're definitely going to poll and we're going to ask people for uh, their thoughts on other topics. Joy, could you just uh, remind us here, please? Is that going live now? Or So, um, unfortunately, um, the gods of Zoom will not allow me to put an open-ended question to yes. everyone, just a multiple choice. So I will ask you to please use the chat and I'm going to save everything in process data later. Oh, that sounds wonderful. Well, yeah, all, thank you for clarifying. all that is for me to do then is to say an enormous thank you to our hosts, our guests, our technical team, and to every one of you who's come and all the ones that have had to leave a little bit early. But we have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed this. Um, we never knew quite what we were doing at the beginning. So I'm so pleased that we've um, managed to get everyone together and managed to pull a session um, for you. I'm hoping we can do more. Um, if you want to put in the chat, we'd love to know your views as to whether you'd like to know a little bit more about either any of the components or the whole lot or anything like that. That would be great. Um, but just to say <coughs> goodbye and thank you so much. Have a lovely rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you thank very you much. Everyone. Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs>